Praise the Lord. So welcome once again, everyone. We're going to get started. And we're looking at Revelation 17, as I mentioned earlier. And just let me pull up our slides here. I think I actually... Uh, one second. Whoops. Here we go. All right. So here we go. All right. Praise the Lord. Can everyone see that? All right. Revelation 17, or in Hebrew, Hahit Galut Yod Zion. So you remember, I've told you before, the Hebrew. Uh, originally, the Hebrew language did not have numbers. And so <clears throat> they used the letter system. And so that's why we use Hebrew letters here. So 17 is the letter Yod, which is 10, and the letter Zion, which is 7, so 17. And that's, again, why it, there are actually uh, things that could be termed like numerology in the scripture. Now, you have to be careful, okay? Some people, obviously, the enemy takes that word and twists it. But I'm talking about scriptural. There are some actual real uh, things related to the number value and the letters, etc. All right, but we don't go into that right now. So what we're looking at is Revelation 17. And um, just by way of an introduction here, chapter 17 of Revelation uh, deals with... Uh, the fall of Babylon, uh, primarily in regard to the character of Babylon as a world religious system, okay? Now, last week in chapter seven, uh, 16, we looked at the seven, sorry, pardon me, it wasn't last week, it was two weeks ago, but we looked at the seven judgments called the bowls of God's wrath that are poured out on the earth. And those um, seven bowls of wrath are the final judgments. It even tells us that in scripture, that these are the last, you know, the wrath of God has finally been poured out. And those were the seven bowls of wrath in chapter 16. So in other words, that's the last uh, of God's judgment on the earth, all right? And that's one reason when you look at that, and I'll give you another reason today too, why I believe, and many believe, and I, I hope most of us believe, that this book of Revelation is talking about yet future prophecy. Okay, some of it could be already fulfilled, but the bottom line is many, there are some who believe that this was fulfilled in the first century. Okay, there's actually some who teach that and believe that, but look, how can that be if it talks about the bowl judgments being the end of God's wrath. Are you telling me he poured it out in the first century and then how uh, the world has gotten increasingly more wicked and he's not going to judge anymore? Uh, come on, folks. Let's get real. So this is talking about future end time judgment. There's no way around it. I'm going to talk about more another significant reason why we see that because when we use the bible itself to interpret itself you know we we take the scriptures literally so we have to use the bible itself you see to interpret so we can't make it say what we want it to say amen it has to say what the word of god originally meant to say and I'm going to show you later on another reason why this is end time future stuff. Now, we are pretty close, I believe, but it's still, you know, future. So having said that, so in chapter 16, if we looked at the final judgments uh, of God's wrath being poured out on earth, why are we then in chapter 17 and we're talking about Babylon falling? What's going on? Well, this is giving us more detail of what happened during those seven uh, judgments called the bowl judgments. And I'll, I'll explain that. So in other words, this is giving us a closer look, more detail of what those judgments were. All right. Now, chapter 18, which is next week, will also continue that, but it's going to be focused more on the political aspect of Babylon. So this week, it's on the religious system, the world religious system that's known as Babylon. It's part of that, you know, Babylon system. 
Next week, it's going to be focusing more on the political one world government aspect of Babylon. See that. Now, some of the key background scriptural texts that are that are in the background of this are um, Isaiah 14 and Jeremiah 51. I encourage you to go and read those in your own time, not right now, later on, because both of those scriptures, Isaiah 14 and Jeremiah 51, speak of the fall of Babylon, and it speaks of a complete, utter destruction of the city of Babylon. And one reason why that is well, first of all, these things are in view in this chapter. They're quoted here, basically. They're referred to. But um, the city of ancient Babylon was never completely destroyed. And so those scriptures, Isaiah 14 and Jeremiah 51, and here in the book of Revelation, can't be looking at ancient Babylon being destroyed because it never was. All right. Let me give you an example real quick, a history, a little bit of a history lesson. You know, the, the kingdom of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, you know, was in, in the city of Babylon, which was one of the wonders of the world. It was on the river Euphrates, and it had huge, it was known to have huge walls. This is described by secular historians, you know, Herodotus and others. The walls of Babylon. And if you live in Toronto, by the way, just uh, this is kind of cool. If you happen to live in Toronto, and if you don't, you must come and visit us. But if you go to the Royal Ontario Museum, I, I even, uh, you know, got, I gosh, I don't even know if it's open these days. I hope it is. But if you go to the Royal Ontario Museum and you go to the ancient uh, Middle Eastern, uh, you know, near and Middle East section, there's an actual section there of the throne room of Nebuchadnezzar in the Toronto Royal Ontario Museum. And you can go and look at it. You can even touch it. But the point is, it's amazing to think the prophet Daniel stood in front of the, these walls. And, and you know, so it's there. You can go check it out. I remember we went, uh, Ali and Bob Buckley and myself and Jonathan Kahn went and we took pictures and whatever. But you can go there. Now, it's this bluish uh, brick color that they created and it has images of lions on it and and so on and uh, if you see that you'll know what the gate of babylon looked like and the walls the walls were said to be thick enough that three chariots could race abreast on top of the walls of babylon these are incredibly thick walls imagine three chariots racing side by side uh, I, I don't know if I would race my chariot on the top of the walls there, but they were huge, tall, very thick. Now, why am I talking about this? Because it was very difficult. No one could really take over and breach that wall uh, in the ancient world and destroy it completely. So what happened was when the Persians came, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, and the Persian Empire rose, and when they uh, wanted to take over the city, by the way, that night, the evening that they took over, there was a party going on in Babylon, and Daniel uh, was there, not taking part in the party, but he was there because there was writing on the wall that appeared. You can read about it in the book of Daniel. And that night, Babylon was overthrown. But listen, it wasn't destroyed by an army. What happened was there was a, a, a canal, if you will, part of the river, that came under the walls to give water to the city. The Persian army could not break the wall. So what they did very cleverly is they dammed the river or that particular uh, branch of it upstream. So the river dried up and the army just went under the walls without a fight and took over. And so that's how Babylon fell. And so the point is, it never really fell in ancient history, and there always remains some kind of settlement there, always. Even today, there's some uh, human settlement there. So these scriptural texts that I'm telling you, Isaiah 14, 
which by the way, it talks about the fall of Babylon. And then very interestingly, it goes right into talking about Lucifer and the, the final, you know, judgment of Lucifer. But then Jeremiah 51. Now we also see in the background of Revelation 17, very much Daniel 7. And Daniel 7 comes up again and again and again throughout the book of Revelation. Here in chapter 17, it is perhaps the most quoted or alluded to in this chapter is Daniel 7. All right. So this is some background. Now, so I just reiterate. So this week, chapter 17, talking about the fall of Babylon, particularly as it relates to its character as a world religious system. Next week that we're going to look at chapter 18 is more about the political one world government system that's going to fall when Yeshua returns. They're related, but not the same. Now, here's just, you know, a brief outline of what we're looking at. So, first of all, the first two verses of chapter 17, we see that Yohanan, or John, is approached by one of the seven angels of the seven bowl judgments. All right. And then in verses three to six, he is shown a vision of a woman riding a scarlet beast. In verse 7, the angel offers to explain this vision to him, and it's called a mystery. And so in verses 8 to 14, he explains the mystery of what the beast is. And then in verses 15 to 18, he describes the mystery of who is the woman riding the beast. All right. So that's the basic outline. And if you are in our Kesher groups, uh, you'll get these notes as well, so you can take a look at that. Um, all right, so here we go. So let's look at the first two verses here, and specifically verse one, it says, Then one of the seven angels holding seven bowls, you know, uh, the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come, I will show you the sentencing of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. So the description here is, this is describing Babylon, as we'll see later, and she is described as a, a prostitute. And this highlights to us that why is she described as a prostitute? Because this highlights to us that the nature of Babylon as this world religious system, okay, and also we'll see that it's, it's interconnected with the economic system, but Basically, it is a seductive nature. This highlights her seductive nature in trying to allure people away from uh, following God and from following the Messiah. Okay, see that? So that's that's why this imagery of the prostitute, because it's seductive. It lures, tries to lure people away. Um, it says that um, it goes on to say she sits on many waters. All right. Now we will find out uh, as we go along, and I've already talked about this before, that many waters is symbolic of many nations. Just look at verse 15. It tells us that's what this means. You see, this is an example, friends, where the Bible interprets itself as well. And even within the book of Revelation, uh, sometimes it interprets itself. See right here, what are these waters? Well, verse 15, he tells us the waters are many nations, all right? Um, so let's just continue on. So the fact that this angel uh, approaches Yohanan and it tells us that the angel is one of the seven angels from the bowl judgments in chapter 16, uh, this indicates to us that chapter 17 and then also 18, because they kind of go together, uh, these are what I would call an amplification of the seven bowl judgments. In other words, more detail is being given, a closer focus on what happened. The bowl judgments were very intense and so on, but they were uh, very general. Now we're looking at a little more detail about what's going on. And so that's by the, that's why it's one of those seven angels who's giving this information. So um, in verse two, it talks about the, the, the kings of the earth. Um, 
I'll just read it. It says, the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who dwell on the earth got drunk with the wine of her immorality. Well, the, um, the sexual immorality that's mentioned here, you know, not only does it refer to actual immorality that will, that is, I would say, rampant on the earth, okay, it was rampant in the days of the Roman Empire, but it's also rampant now and increasing and getting worse. And it will even get worse as part of the world system. And we can, all right, I want to point out one other thing that's not in my notes, but I, this came to me earlier and I think it's interesting. The Hebrew word that is used for, to describe prostitution is the same word. It's basically the Hebrew word zona, like sounds like zone or zona, but you know, zona, Hebrew means prostitute or prostitution it's the same almost identical word for what we call tares like in the parable that you should have said the wheat and the tares and it's you know very interesting because in the end times there will be wheat and tares tares look like wheat as they grow it looks like wheat you can almost not tell the difference until the end until the harvest then the tares turn dark color and they become poisonous. Uh, but, you know, so there's good, and it talks of the end time, the harvest, then these things will be sorted out. But I just thought I'd mention that that word in Hebrew in that parable has to do with prostitution. So it links to what we're talking about. Also, I might mention without going up too far off track, that according to ancient Jewish tradition, the, and this is based on uh, ancient Jewish writings of the time of Yeshua, that the, the wheat and the tares, these aren't two different species, according to Jewish tradition. What it is, the tares are corrupted wheat that was corrupted by the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 in incident. In other words, the fallen angels, when they corrupted, uh, it said all the earth had become corrupt. It referred to corruption of genetics, except it said Noah and his generation, his family were not corrupted. But in Jewish thought of the first century and before, that included that they did GMO experiments on uh, agriculture. And so the tares were actually corrupted wheat corrupted by the Nephilim. So that's another just uh, bit of background. But let's get back to Revelation 17. So we see that the sexual immorality that this uh, prostitute who's Babylon commits with the kings, the rulers of the earth, and the people of the earth. So not just the rulers, but many people will engage in this too. So guys, we've got to admit that if we take this literally and follow the scriptures, it means that many, many, many of the world's leaders are going to be taking part in this. Um, perhaps there will be some who stand against it, but I think many, if not, you know, it's going to be hard to be a world leader, okay, and not be under the influence of this. But many of them are going to be involved, but many just people are going to be under that influence. They're going to be drunk with this. It's going to be like they're going to be bewitched, all right? Now, um, the sexual immorality that's talked about there, again, as I've mentioned, is not only true and real immorality. Guys, I remember one thing. I remember back in the mid to late 80s, I was watching a TV show back then. It was called Miami Vice. Some of you maybe watched it. I don't know. Uh, but I clearly remember one day watching it. And as I watched it, they used language, and this was on primetime television back in the day, in the 80s. And suddenly, just like that, they started to use language that they would have never used before. And at that point, way back then, I realized the media and the television programs, even on prime time, were changing, and they were starting to allow things that they never would have allowed before. And that was in the 80s. What is it like now? 
Um, you know, we were watching videos with one of our, you know, our young daughter, and they were um, children's, you know, pretty innocent uh, programs, cartoons, and we try to make sure that they're very healthy and, and safe. But we were watching them on a platform, YouTube, and as we're watching it, then they show commercials. And some of the commercials they show, and they must know that young, young children are watching this. These commercial, commercials, uh, advertisements show like demonic uh, animated things that are very scary and just evil. And so we're seeing this increase more and more. So it's real immorality. It's also that the world system is gonna align itself with this false religious system. And it also speaks of and has economic overtones because as we see when we go into chapter 18, uh, the, we will see that the cup of the, uh, the harlot or the prostitute Babylon is also related to the economic system of the world, okay? So it has all of those components when it talks about uh, saying the earth's kings committed sexual immorality and those who dwell on the earth got drunk with the wine of her immorality. Okay, so now let's move ahead. So uh, the, uh, the verse three tells us that the angel carried Yochanan away uh, in the Ruach and he saw a vision, right? Now, when it says he was carried away in the Ruach, this means that this was a, a vision, you know, spiritual vision that he saw not a physical actual journey. And in the vision, he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And it says that she is riding this beast. It says, um, I, you know, he says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous, blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. So obviously this is, uh, she's riding the beast that we already saw earlier in the book of Revelation coming out of the waters, again, which mentioned coming out of the nations, and it's related to the beast from Daniel 7. There's, you know, these again. But I also just want to mention quickly, um, there is a symbol of the European Union that some connected this to, um, and because what's on the euro, the euro is the main, uh, you know, uh, currency of the European Union, and it's a symbol of the European Union. It is a woman riding a beast, a bull. And now it's probably not exactly this same thing, but it is interesting because the woman riding the bull, which is at the European Parliament outside, and it's on the Euro, is from uh, the Greek mythology, and she is Europa which Europe gets its name. Now, who was she? She was a princess from Sidonia. Sidonia is what is now modern day Lebanon. And Sidonia in modern day Lebanon, and part of it lived on in the town Sidon. Remember Tyre and Sidon? The whole region was called Sidonia. They had a king. And in that region was Mount Hermon. Now, according to the Jewish tradition and also other pagan traditions, a group of rebellious angels known as the Watchers came down on Mount Hermon. And they, that's the whole Genesis 6 story where they began to corrupt all the generations and all these things and create the Nephilim or the giants. Now, from the Greek perspective, which is listen, I'm not preaching it as if it's the word of God, I'm just telling you where this comes from, is that one of these beings, but he was known as Zeus to them, to them, he was their chief, you know, God, but in Jewish thought, and uh, he was a, a fallen angel, but he, he came down and he captured this princess Europa from Sidonia, and he came in the form of a bull, and he actually kidnapped her, took her away. He, he basically violated her or raped her. And then she had offspring that were what we would call the Nephilim. 
but she was the founder of Europe. That's where Europe gets its name from. Interesting. So now having said that, I don't think that this is exactly what's being described here because the beast here has seven heads and 10 horns. So it's a little bit different, but still there are some similarities in the sense that it's ultimately, uh, you know, an evil, you know, thing that we're seeing going on. Now, um, the, the fact that she's riding this beast, the fact that this prostitute, you know, the woman Babylon is riding the beast denotes that there's a close alliance with the governmental system because the beast with the seven heads and 10 horns, we've already seen and we'll see next week and, and even this week that it represents the governmental system, the world government. And so she's not, it's not exactly that there's the same thing, but they are closely allied, closely related. And she's sitting atop it. In fact, you could also say the government is propping her up. They keep it going. All right. So there's an, so this is interesting because what we see here is that in the end times, there's going to be a relation and an alliance between a religious system and a governmental system. And it's, it'll all be intertwined economically. Okay. Are we seeing it already? Uh, well, we're going to see it soon. Now, um, the beast has seven heads and 10 horns. Again, this is an obvious reference to the one world government. We saw this in chapter 13, verse one. And this is based on the beast, the fourth beast from Daniel seven. We're also told that the woman is clothed in purple, scarlet, and with gold and precious stones and pearls. What does that tell us? Well, basically, I mean, obviously it represents wealth, right? you know, gold and precious stones. And also in the ancient world, purple was one of the most expensive dyes and, you know, purple garments and so on represented, you know, royalty and priesthood. And in fact, uh, so it represents the riches. And again, the connection to the economic system that this religious system will have, but, uh, you know, also we do see uh, that, uh, some of these colors and, and so on are, have been related to some of the ritualistic religious systems in the world, okay, without saying too much more, right? Now, the description of the woman here also confirms that she represents worldly economic system uh, forces intertwined with the religious system that are in collusion with the state, and it says that she is persecuting the true believers in Messiah. All right, so this is the picture we're getting. All right, now I want to look at just briefly here, um, Jeremiah 51, 7, which says, Babylon has been a golden cup in Adonai's hand, intoxicating the whole earth. The nations drunk her wine, so the nations are going crazy. Um, and... So that's basically what we see in this vision is that the woman has a, a, a golden cup. And so it's based on this Jeremiah 51 uh, verse. And even though she has it in her hand and it says, you know, the nations are, um, you know, uh, taking part in it. Yet in Jeremiah 51, what we see, and I think we'll see this later on in chapter 17 here, is that it's really the Lord is, is in control. And even though she has a golden cup in her hand, in a sense, she's in his hand. Like it's not that she's out of God's control in that sense. God is omnipotent, all powerful. Amen. So the cup in her hand is said to be full of detestable things and the filth of her immorality. In verse two, this was described as being the wine of her adulteries. So again, it speaks of false religion, the adulteries. Uh, now, we're also told that the woman has a name on her head. And it says, um, let me put it on here. 
On her forehead was written a name, mystery, Babylon the great, mother of prostitutes and detestable things of the earth. Now, the word mystery, as it hears in this translation, is probably not part of the name itself. It, so it, some people say it is. So the name is actually Mystery Babylon. Some say that. But others say, no, uh, on her forehead was written a name, a mystery. Okay, And then the name is Babylon the Great, Mother of Prostitutes, etc. Now, um, this is in contrast, obviously, to the name written on, that will be written on the foreheads of those who are uh, faithful, true believers in the Lord, in Hashem, and in Yeshua. His name will be on our foreheads. But here, this is a contrast. Now, biblically, so her name now, this is where we see the name is Babylon, all right? This is where we see the name is Babylon. Now, the name Babylon is, again, taken from the ancient city, as I mentioned earlier, that was on the uh, Euphrates River. Biblically speaking, Babylon is seen as the source of not only the world government system, or a kind of a political empire that would have worldwide ambitions, but also the source of false world religious systems. It goes all the way back to Genesis 11. Now I know that you know historians and archeologists who study the ancient Near and Middle East can talk about you know, the Sumerians and all these other groups. And that's all very interesting, and you know maybe some of it's true. But the bottom line is this: some uh, some of these deities that we talk about, and we will be talking about these false deities. Yes, they have different names in different cultures. The Egyptians had different names for them, and so on. But biblically speaking, that's what I'm here to focus on. Babylon is seen as the source of the one world government system and the one world false religious system. And it starts in Genesis 11, where Nimrod began to create a global, he wanted to rule all the people. And his name in Hebrew, Nimrod, actually means let us rebe rebel. We will rebel. Against who? Against the Lord God. That's what it means also when it says he became a mighty one before God. Actually, it means in the face of God. <laughs> it doesn't mean, oh, God was pleased. No, he was in rebellion and he was in God's face in his rebellion. That's what this means. And later on, and we have to always remember this, and I've mentioned it many times, that in biblical Hebrew, that place was called Babel. Babel, right? But then later, when we see the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, thousands of years later set up, we call it Babylon. But hold on. In Hebrew, it's the same word, Babel. What does that tell us? That it's the same thing. It's the same place. It's the same program was being continued, trying to set up a one world government and a one world false religious system. So Babel and Babylon is the same word in Hebrew, and that's significant. Now, I'm going to read a quote to you from a commentary which describes the connection to Babylon and to uh, the false world religious system, all right? And this is coming from a commentary on the book of Revelation from 1985. It's a little bit dated, but still, you know, at the time he was writing this, I was watching Miami Vice. Okay. Sorry. I just have to, I should have been writing commentaries at that time. Anyways, here we go. So this was written by John Walvoord, who was a, you know, Bible scholar. He's now with the Lord. He was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Here's what he has to say. I've already, by the way, talked about the fall of Babylon when the Persian Empire rose and took it over. But here's what he says. After the Persians took over Babylon in 539 BC, 
they discouraged the continuation of the mystery religions in Babylon. See, just one second. In Babylon, they had a religious system and it became known as the mystery religions. And therefore, that's part of this mystery, you know, Babylon. So the Persians discouraged the continuation of mystery religions of Babylon. Subsequently, therefore, the Babylonian cultists, or I would say occultists, moved where? To Pergamum. Pergamum, where later in the, well, in the book of Revelation, we see the throne of Satan is there. So they, these Babylonian cultists moved to Pergamum or Pergamos, where one of the seven congregations of Asia Minor was located in Revelation 2, 12 to 17. Um, now listen to this. He continues. Crowns in the shape of fish heads were worn by the chief priests of the Babylonian cult to honor the fish god, also known as Dagon. So let me just stop there. In other words, and there are actual inscriptions in stone of this. You can look it up. The Babylonian priests had these hats that looked like a fish head, okay? And that's just what they did because they, one of the gods they worshipped was this god Dagon. That's why when Jonah was spit out of the mouth of a great fish and landed on their shores, uh, they were astonished and they listened to what he had to say because they worshipped a fish god. <laughs> and he seemed to come forth from this great fish. Right, so um, the, the crowns that they wore honored this fish god. And the crowns, listen to this. Hold on. Uh, actually, just give me one second here, guys. Oh, so one where we left off, these, these uh, priests of the Babylonian cult that moved to Pergamum wore these fish head hats, right? And on these crowns, it said this word, keeper of the bridge. All right, symbolic of the bridge. Now, to us, symbolic of what bridge? Well, to them, symbolic of the bridge between them and the gods, which that's what Babel meant. You know, it was a it was a gateway to to God, uh, but it was a man made one. But so they had these hats, these crowns, and it said keeper of the bridge. Now let's fast forward. This name this handle was adopted by the roman emperors listen and the roman emperors used the latin title from these babylonian priests and so the bridge keeper of the bridge became pontifex the pontiff maximus so the roman emperors took this name and it means major keeper of the bridge so they kind of became the high priest of the Roman Empire, but they, you can draw a direct line to the Roman empires from the Babylonian mystery cult. And they called themselves Pontifex, Max, Pontifex Maximus. The same title was later used by the Bishop of Rome, uh, known as the Pope. When the teachers of the Babylonian mystery religions later moved from Pergamum to Rome, see these guys moved from Babylon to Pergamum and to Rome, they were influential in paganizing Christianity and were the source of many so-called religious rites which have crept into ritualistic congregations. Babylon, then, is a symbol of apostasy and blasphemous substitution of idol worship for the worship of God in Messiah. So that's a quote. Now, I interjected my comments, but You'll see the quote in the notes. And again, that's by John Wolvert. So it's interesting, the, the connection from Babylon to Pergamum to Rome. And then even we see how that title pontiff crept in. And by the way, what kind of hat is worn? When you look at the mitre that is worn by some bishops and, and so on, and the pontiff, it looks like a fish head and it came from this didn't pop out of nowhere it wasn't described in the bible the apostles didn't wear it it came from this and so i'm just saying this is where that came from all right now i'm going to do one more verse and then we're going to stop and we're going to continue this next week because i i'm sorry this is going over time 
And again, there's a lot of information here. But let's jump to verse 7, okay? And I'll just put it on the screen here for us. Um, it says, um, But the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So, um, you know, when Yohanan saw the vision of this woman, on the beast and it, she was clothed in you know all these rich garments etc and she had the gold cup and it's all these things he was he was astonished it says he was astounded when i saw her that's in verse six so the ain so he didn't know what to make of it he was like blown away so the angel says to him why are you astonished and he now offers to um explain <clears throat> um why you know what the this vision means all right so in other words this is a good place to stop because up till now it had you know the vision and then now the angel is offering to interpret the vision for yohanan and it you know and so basically all right there's one other thing though i want to mention before i close so i want to go back to verse six because i missed this and i don't want to miss this so before we close i just want to look at this here's verse six so one of the things that he saw in the vision and it this is where it says i was astounded um he says i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the kedoshim and the blood of the witnesses of yeshua when i saw her i was totally astounded so this tells us some very important things number one uh, that this world system and even people who think that they will be worshiping God, they even think that they're part of the, you know, this, this religious system, it'll be a false system. Some of them might even be apostate believers, as I've just shown you, all right, from, you know, the connection to where paganism creeps in. And that's why, as believers, I say, pray to the lord to show you you know and give you discernment about what things might need to be renounced um you know what i'm saying because things have crept in i cannot not tell you what the bible says i have to tell you what the bible says and we can't dance around the issue and we can't make it say what we want so the bottom line is there is a connection to the world system going all the way back to Babylon. And yes, it crept in to the, unfortunately, to the church. The woman here is drunk with the blood of the Kedoshim. This tells us that this, this system will actually persecute believers and literally to the point of killing believers. And again, this will be the world religious system. Now, here we see that it says the blood of the Kedoshim and the blood of the witnesses of Yeshua. There's two ways to interpret this. Some people interpret this to mean that there are two different groups and that the, this word and, you know, so the blood of the Kedoshim and with the blood of the witnesses, that, that's the Greek word kai, which is just and. But some people say that, well, that, that word and is just uh, what we would call, um, it's explanatory. What does that mean? It means it's explaining further who these Kedoshim are. So in other words, it's saying the blood of the Kedoshim, you know what I mean, the blood of the witnesses of Yeshua. That's, that's one explanation. Now, the other explanation is that these are two distinct groups of people. I actually personally favor the latter interpretation and i'll tell you why because i believe that the persecution in the end times and i base this on revelation chapter 12 for example will be on the people of israel especially those who are you know trying to worship god through judaism living in israel now, they're not, might not be believers. Some of them might be, but the bottom line is they are still Kedoshim. They are still set apart by God. 
the you know Romans uh, book of Romans tells us the calling and election of uh, uh, of God is irrevocable, and everybody loves that verse, right? And says, hey, that applies to my gift as whatever an artist or whatever, the calling and the gifts. But in the context of the book of Romans, chapter 9, 10, 11, it's talking about the covenant with Israel. So the covenant with Israel as being a set-apart people of God is without uh, revocation. It is irrevocable forever. And God makes this clear throughout the scriptures. So this group, the Kedoshim, could be Israel, and the witnesses of Yeshua could refer to Messianic believers from around the world. Because in Revelation 12, we see that both groups are persecuted. And I want to just say this, the anti-Messiah spirit against Messiah and against the believers is also the same spirit as the anti-Semitic spirit. They're not different, it's the same. And so that's how I interpret this. That's, again, there are two ways. Going back to verse seven, here's where we'll close. The angel is now going to introduce and say to Yochanan, you know, let me interpret this vision for you because obviously you're astonished, you're blown away. Let me interpret it for you. And so that's where we're going to pick it up next week. Unless you guys agree that we could continue the service for three more hours. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're going to continue it next week, guys. We're going to close it here. I really